Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Today, we're going to be talking about licensing state athletic commissions and whether this stuff is actually necessary or not. So nothing gets me to eye beaming, you know, the, the, the blink beam and eye meme that you've seen on every YouTube video, quite like licensing and government interference in business. And any opportunity I can find to discuss that subject within the context of pro wrestling, I'm going to do it. I was on Twitter and I stumbled across Shaza McKenzie. I'm not sure if you guys remember who she was, but she's an Australian pro wrestler who worked in AEW temporarily during the early days. And uh, she's been stuck over in Australia for a while during the pandemic. And now she's back in the country. So she she was promoting a change.org petition. And her tweet said, quote, please sign this petition so I don't have to sign a form saying I'm not pregnant before I wrestle or compete a breast and gynecology exam. Thanks. And the the goal of the change.org petition is, quote, free promote professional wrestling from the Missouri Athletics Commission. And your, your boy was like, oh, God. Oh, hell yeah. Let's let's see what this is about. So I read the petition. And I'm going to read the petition to you. As of right now, the petition has 1,907 uh, signers. They're trying to get 2,500. So here is the petition. Professional wrestling in the state of Missouri has been unfairly ruled over and taxed for years by the Missouri Athletics Commission or the Missouri Office of Athletics. Often treated the same as professional boxing, kickboxing, full contact karate, and other mixed martial arts, professional wrestlings, the wrestlers, and the promoters have been and continue to pay indefensible amounts of fees, have to jump through numerous hoops to gain and maintain their licenses, and then are taxed coming and going by the Missouri Athletics Commission. Here's an example. A promotion is holding an event where they are charging $20 per seat. And in this example, let's say the promotion donates 10 seats to a local charity complimentary tickets. This means that the promotion will not see a profit from these tickets. Now, under the new rules set this year by the Missouri Athletics Commission, the promotion will now be taxed for every single seat, even complimentary seats, even seats that may have been donated to a charity. Do you need another example? In 2022, the permits for professional wrestling are $150 per day per event with a plan to raise the cost of the licenses for the wrestlers across the board. And why? Not because they need funds to ensure the safety and welfare of the athletes, but because the Missouri Athletics Commission uses those funds to ensure that they have continued to exist. Yes, all the money that is paid by our local professional wrestling promotions do not go back to the taxpayers. They do not help pr protect the athletes, but they go into the coffers of the Missouri Athletics Commission to make sure that they have the funds to continue for another year. And when addressing the worries of the promotions about the Missouri Athletics Commission, continuing to add to the cost of running wrestling in Missouri, the Missouri Athletics Commission responded by saying, quote, while no one, including myself, likes to pay more for services, if the surcharge on all events regulated by the office does increase revenue to at least equal expenses, the office will have to look into other methods to increase revenue. At least now the surcharge, it can be passed on to the attending public. And this is a fraction of the problems with the Missouri Athletics Commission and professional wrestling. Their rules, regulations, and reasoning behind these fees, I humbly request that professional wrestling is removed from the Missouri Statute 317 and is no longer under the authority of the Missouri Athletics Commission or the Missouri Office of Athletics. Oh, so guess what? So guess what I did? You know what I did? I went to the Missouri Office of Athletics and I looked to see what the big deal was. So here's what I found. And we're going to get, we're going to get real deep into this because as we, if you listen to what I just said, you know that the warlord of all wrestling, Vince McMahon tried to get wrestling removed from state athletic commissions, not just for taxes, but also to get rid of regulations. What you might not know is that Lyndon McMahon went to Pennsylvania two years before Vince 
told New Jersey that he wanted to get out of there, the State Athletic Commission. Linda went to Pennsylvania and argued the exact same thing in 1987. We're going to get into all of that. We're going to also talk about uh, licenses and how they are a barrier to entry for businesses and how they have been helping uh, monopolies in pro wrestling. Oh, we're about to do a big, a big thing on licenses. All right. We're about to do a lot of that stuff. But let's go to the Missouri Office of Athletics. So in 1983, the Missouri Office of Athletics was organized under the Department of Economic Development and it was a division of professional registration. In 2007, it, an executive order from the governor moved it to the, Depart the Division of Insurance, Financial Institutions, and Professional Registration. Um, the director of professional registration has the authority to make the rules for the Missouri Office of Athletics. The mission of the Missouri Office of Athletics is to protect health and safety of participants in pro boxing, sparring, pro wrestling, pro and amateur kickboxing, pro and amateur MMA, and pro full contact karate. The commission regulates promoters, contestants, matchmakers, referees, judges, timekeepers, seconds, and physicians. The following, no, now, that's a lot of people, by the way. You, re, you are required to have a license. All licenses expire June 30th each year. Medical examinations are required. So when she said she didn't, she didn't want to have to sign a form saying that she's not pregnant, that means that she has to have a full examination. The, the licensee must use uh, the same name consistently and provide their real name and address. That's not on here, but they have to provide their address as well. We'll talk about that in a moment. Now, there's the fees. For a promoter, the license is $400. For a contestant, which means a wrestler, it's $40. For a referee or a judge, it's $50. For a matchmaker, which means the person who is responsible for putting the matches together, $200. For a physician, it is nothing. So physicians do not have to pay. Now, in the change.org petition, they mentioned a surcharge on seats. The Missouri State of Athletics confirms there's a $1 surcharge per ticket sold or issued, which includes complimentary tickets. That means they have to, even if they don't sell the ticket, they have to pay a dollar if they give the ticket away. That's what, this is the state for you. Now, a license and a permit are two different things. Now, we, I decided to go a little bit deeper and start talking about permits, which is almost the exact same thing. But they are two different things. Is that each contest requires a separate permit. Permits will not be issued for one intergender or intersex fights in boxing, MMA, or karate. This doesn't include pro wrestling, of course. Two, interspecies bouts, so no humans versus animals. Three, no pros versus amateurs. Or four, no con contests with two or more contestants. So, of course, this also doesn't apply to pro wrestling. Permits cost $150 per day per contest. Now, I did look up the word contest because I was saying to myself, there's no way that you have an eight match card and you have to pay $150 per match. It's just not possible. But per match would be per bout. They decide that a match is a bout. So a contest is an event, essentially. So it says, so upon doing that, I was on the website anyway. I decided to do a little bit of digging. And I said, hmm, you know, public information, and yes siree, pro wrestlers' public addresses are available. I looked up a certain female pro wrestler in the database and was able to find her address. Now, it could have been a P.O. box, entirely possible, but I got her real name and I got her address. So if you know anything about, you know, pro wrestling fans, you know, Alexa Bliss, Sonya Deville, all the situations that involve stalkers over the years. Oh, it's easy to find a female wrestler's address. All you need to go to do is go to the State Athletic Commission and look up her name. And you can get her address. How about, especially if it requires her to use her real name and her real address. So, hey, how about that? So, another little, another, just some fun stuff here. 
So the WWE has been licensed promoter in Missouri since 1984 um, as Event Services Incorporated. Their license will expire June 30th, 19, I mean 2024. The NWA Lightning One, which is the Billy Corrigan version of the NWA, um, they got their license on July the 8th, 2021, and it will expire June 30th, 2024. Um, Harley Ray still has his license, even though he's dead. Um, his World Wrestling League got its license on July the 10th, 2000, and it will expire June 30th, 2024. So, the state of, of Missouri... <laughs> As people's personal information out there and it requires for you to take a physical in order to get a license in order to be a licensed pro wrestler in Missouri is it's not that expensive. I know some people are going to say that, say, hey, it's only 40 bucks. If you're a wrestler, that's not that big of a deal. I'm sure. Sure, it's not. But it is a bit of a barrier to entry. Now, in the next part, we're going to talk about. The McMahons going head up with the state athletic commissions. And then near the end, we're going to talk a little bit more about how this is sort of a barrier to entry for various businesses. In 1989, the warlord of all wrestling, Vincent Kennedy McMahon, was, he was still sort of in his pupil stage. And he had run a couple of WrestleManias, but he still had opponents. They still existed. And Vince goes to the State Athletic Board of New Jersey. And he is trying to get rid of the regulations on pro wrestling, but he's arguing this through tax court, which is a little bit different than what Linda Wick's doing. Now, the WWF in 1990 and 1992 was embroiled with this legal situation in New Jersey in which they were arguing over what was called the media rights tax. The media rights tax was a tax on a promoter reselling the rights to a sporting event that was based in New Jersey. So WWF gets, got hit with this media rights tax three times. WrestleMania 4, WrestleMania 5, and SummerSlam. I think it was SummerSlam 88, I believe, or SummerSlam 89, one of the two. Whichever one took place in the Meadowlands. And Vince tried to stop this the first time. He refused to pay the media rights tax the first time it was imposed. So let's get into some of the details that we're talking about here. So, WrestleMania 4 took place March 27th, 1988. It was a licensed event in the state of New Jersey. There was a tax on the sale of tickets. There were 615 pay-per-view cable operators nationally licensed to show the event. 22 of those were stated in New Jersey. Titan received $5,973,358 from the cable pay-per-view providers. $461,890 of those monies came from New Jersey operators. 129 closed circuit theaters were contracted to showcase this event. Nine were located in New Jersey. Titan received $5,535,256 in ticket sales from those closed circuit events. 1,554,529 of that came from New Jersey patrons. The international broadcasting rights needed Titan over $83,000. Plus the video replay rights to the program were sold to 615 cable operators. The board imposed a media rights tax on WrestleMania 4 to the tune of $61,639. Titan, of course, refused to pay. The state of New Jersey says, hey, we will pull your license. You will not be able to run in New Jersey until you pay this tax. So Vince paid the tax. WrestleMania 5. April 2nd, 1989, was disseminated in the same manner as WrestleMania 4, SummerSlam, August 28th, 1989, disseminated in the same way. Each time, WWF got hit with a media rights tax. So, the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission was a three-member board, and their mission was to regulate and govern the health and safety of wrestlers, provide licensing for participants, promoters, timekeepers, referees, announcers, and to ensure mandatory medical and accident insurance to be paid by the promoters. They saw a mandatory insurance amount of 
paid out to wrestlers between June 13th, 1989 and January 29th, 1990. Such regulations that the board required was that wrestlers had to be between the ages of 18 to 45. They had to submit to cardiograms. They were prohibited from having any disabled performers. Pre-exhibition physicals had to be performed. First aid crews and ambulances had to be on hand. These were just some examples of the things that um, was required. There was also uh, certain requirements for the ring. There were ring requirements, like certain padding or something like that for the ring. So Titan argued that the media rights tax was a violation of the First Amendment because the tax was content-based. They also, uh, of course, the board disagreed with this. They also attempted to argue that the tax violated the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution and also violated the Foreign Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. This is all very technical stuff for the record. I don't want to, I wrote all this stuff out. I'm not going to go through the trouble of reading it all because I don't want to bore anybody to death. But Titan's argument that it was a violation of the First Amendment is that Vince argues that video productions are expressive activity, that there are depictions of moral issues and are best classified as dramatic social satire, and that the pro wrestling content was singled out because no other video programs depicting dramas are subject to the media rights tax. The board, of course, disagreed and said that wrestling is not a form of protected speech and that wrestling is pure entertainment that it lacks the communicative elements that is to be classified as speech and that pro wrestling should not be considered uh, protected speech under the first amendment and that it should be classified as symbolic speech and that the tax is valid because it is not subject to prior restraint. In other words, it does not prevent you from doing anything. It basically taxes you for doing it. So if you don't want to sell tapes, of WrestleMania 4, and you don't have to pay the media rights tax. But if you do want to sell tapes of WrestleMania 4, well, you have to sell, you have to pay the media rights tax. So, the judge in 1990 argued that the, that if the media rights tax, if the purpose of the media rights tax is to raise revenue for the state, then the media rights tax is unconstitutional. But if the purpose of the media rights tax is to act as a license for these reproductions, then it is constitutional. The tax is written as a way to be a license, but there is no certification protocols. So the the court found that there was not enough evidence to say that it was narrowly defined, yet they still argued that there is nothing within the content of the WWF shows to state that the primary purpose of professional wrestling is to make political or religious statements, but to make a profit. Therefore, the tax is not unconstitutional. So Vince loses. The, uh, they also lost on the financial commerce clause argument and therefore all other arguments. But so there was no summary judgment, uh, which is what WWE wanted. So, no summary judgment, that means they have to go to, to trial. 1992, the trial uh, go is, is taking place. This is a really strange time for Vince because he's, you know, being sued all over the place. You know, this is right around the time of the Ring Boy scandal and steroid trial and everything. So, the board, uh, they argued that they're tasked with examining and providing assurance for 250 wrestlers, 29 referees, 28 timekeepers, and 19 different wrestling promotions. Their inspectors are in the locker rooms monitoring and collection, monitoring the collection of tax receipts, assisting promoters with tabulating ticket sales, keeping track of health information of the performers, making sure it is all accurate and updated. They found that 25% of the board's expenses were devoted to pro wrestling. So 25% more than anything else that they did was regulating pro wrestling. Now, they had the complete amount that the state brought in from wrestling, but I focus purely on where they got from WWE. In 1987, in taxes and receipts, they got $11,000 from WWE. 
1988, that jumps up to $91,000. In 1989, it skyrockets to $164,000. And in 1990, they get a little bit of a break, $109,000. That's how much they pay each year in taxes and fees. Uh, the state argued that Titan was the only wrestling promotion that sold media rights to a New Jersey event and therefore the only promotion subject to the media rights tax, which seems unfair to me. The court found that the state athletic board has a substantial and important interest in imposing the media rights tax, which is the regulation of hazardous wrestling matches, which is a health and safety argument. And that the media rights tax is, quote, essential to further New Jersey's substantial interest in regulating professional wrestling. So there that goes. In the footnotes to the lawsuit, there's a couple of things that I want to bring up to make sure that we're all clear. Uh, it says, quote, Titan also exhibited WrestleMania 4 and 5 by closed circuit television to audiences in theaters in New Jersey and other states. Since Titan itself directly transmitted the closed circuit television events, it did not license the right to broadcast WrestleMania 4 and 5 to others. The media rights tax is not an issue as to the simultaneous broadcast in theaters. Okay. It says the media rights tax applies to the lease or sale of broadcast rights to boxing and wrestling matches or exhibitions. Licensing agreements provided for the right to use wrestling exhibitions for television broadcast are included within the scope of lease or sale of television rights and no argument to the contrary has been made by Titan. So, WWE knew that they were going to be taxed if they sold the rights to WrestleMania 4 and 5 to television stations or if they sold tapes or whatever. And they did not argue whether that was the case or not. There was another little interesting bit here that I want to point out to you guys. It says, quote, total expenditures of the board for the years 1989 and 1990 averaged $1,048,000. For these years, Titan's payments for taxes and fees averaged approximately $137,000. Although Titan's share of taxes and fees paid by wrestling promoters was substantial because of Titan's substantial wrestling promotions, its contribution to total board revenues from taxes and fees paid during 1989 and 1990 averaged only 16%, and a total of board expenditures averaged 13%. To give you a little bit more color on how confusing all this crap was, there was two different types of taxes WWE had to pay. This is from the 1990 court filing. It says the first is a graduated tax on ticket sales. And it says the tax is imposed on gross receipts from ticket sales, including the face value of complimentary tickets at a rate of 3% on the first $25,000, 4% on the next $50,000, 5% on the next $125,000 and 6% of amounts exceeding $200,000 with a total cap of $100,000. So the more tickets you sold, the higher you had to pay in taxes. That's absurd, but is a progressive tax that we have in the United States. The more money you make, the more you get taxed. That's just kind of how it goes. Now, this is the, the sort of the details on the media rights tax. It says, quote, the media rights tax is imposed on a declining basis, 5% on the first $50,000, 3% on the next $100,000, 2% on the next $100,000, and 1% on amounts in excess of $250,000 with a cap on $100,000. Both taxes must be paid within seven days of the conclusion of the event. Taxes collected by the board are to be put in the state athletic control board account, which is used for the necessity expenses of the board. Any surplus from the account is to be returned to the state general fund. And if additional funding is required for the board, it shall be available from the general fund. That means there's going to be a certain percentage of this that is going to go to the state athletic commission. The rest is going to go to the state coffers. So, the idea that they were using this money to ensure insurance and health and safety and all that crap. No, there, it was just going back into their own pockets. 
if they decided to use it to ensure health and safety and all that kind of stuff, they could always argue that they could. Of course, nobody's going to argue that they did so effectively. They can't really argue that, can they? Because uh, how do you know? What is what is the definition of effective government control of whatever, whatever, right? So the media rights, t- so the media rights tax that Vince McMahon was arguing against is considered a licensing fee for the state of Pennsylvania. Or yes, it is no the state of New Jersey. It is considered a licensing fee. So is a license. Right. So uh, New Jersey, they won the first round, but Vince is not one for giving up. And in 1997, eventually he did win that battle. So this is from the New York Times. Trenton deregulates wrestling as gasp. It's a non-sport. Going to read a little piece of this. It says proven that she will do anything to show her zeal for cutting taxes and helping business. Governor Todd, Christine Todd Whitman stood by side by side today with a man of prodigious size, long flowing auburn colored hair and tattooed muscles bulging from his sleeveless full length black leather frock. The popular wrestler known as the undertaker peered ominously over Mrs. Whitman's shoulder as she signed a bill that makes New Jersey one of a small group of states to officially recognize professional wrestling as a form of entertainment and not a sport. By doing so, the state was able to deregulate the industry and eliminate a special tax it had been charging for televised wrestling events. In their lobbying effort to repeal the tax, wrestling industry officials acknowledge that their events are staged and choreographed, an admission that may have disappointed the faithful, but did not shock most others familiar with the absurd theatrics that have characterized professional wrestling for generations. We never try to insult anyone's intelligence, said Jay Andronaco, a spokesman for the World Wrestling Federation, a major promoter of the events. Do these guys get hit and take a punch? Yes. But is some of it choreographed? Of course. The new law frees the State Athletic Commission Board from overseeing wrestling and allows the industry to stage televised events in New Jersey without paying a $100,000 media tax. For eight years, events that have been regulated by the athletic board for safety reasons like wrestling, boxing, and martial arts have been subject to the tax. As a result, no major professional wrestling events have been televised from New Jersey since 1990. A number of attempts to deregulate the industry have failed over the last several years in New Jersey. Under the deregulation law, pro wrestlers will no longer have to pass physicals before exhibition matches, and the wrestlers, as well as the promoters, timekeepers, and referees, will not need licensing by the state. By signing this legislation, Ms. Whitman said, we are recognizing that professional wrestling is entertainment, not a sport. By eliminating this tax, we will bring these productions back to New Jersey, creating jobs and generating revenues that are currently enjoyed by our neighboring states. Uh, so... That is, so Vince wins. He wins the long game. He lost the short game. He won the long game. He just kept at it, you know. You climb a mountain a little at a time, as they say. So he did eventually defeat the media rights tax. It eventually went down in flames. Now, um, there was some some more to this. It says, uh, by permitting professional wrestling, New Jersey is expected to earn about $200,000 in sales taxes plus the ancillary benefits of hotel restaurant and other revenues generated by out of state fans, state officials and promoters said Mrs. McMahon, that'd be Linda McMahon said about two twenty thousand 20,000 people attend a major wrestling event at today's news conference at the continental arena. Mrs. McMahon announced two events that will be held in the arena later this year. The bill sponsor, Paul D Gaetano, the assembly major majority leader who is a Republican from Pasic said promoters had promised him that as soon as the tax was eliminated, professional wrestling productions would rush back to New Jersey. Today's announcement was staged with the type of theater that befits the industry in a news release. Mrs. Whitman was billed as Christine the Trenton Tornado, while Mr. D. Gaetano was called Power the Pasic Powerhouse. With a blank stare on his heavily made-up face, Undertaker entered the room with a, from a dark corner and gave a cardboard cut out of a tombstone to Mrs. Whitman. With the help of the Undertaker, I now will put this tax to rest, and may it rest in peace, Mrs. Whitman said. Looking up at the huge, scowling wrestler, the governor remarked, 
This is an intimidating moment. So New Jersey got the head out of their ass and stopped doing what literally made no sense. And that is uh, regulating wrestling as a sport. And yet states still do it. There are still states that do this. It's, it's ridiculous that this is continuing to go on in the modern world. But uh, wrestling has been largely deregulated in some places. They don't have state athletic commissions, but in some places they still do. So Vince wouldn't be the only guy to be doing battle with state athletic commissions. Um, it will become a regular occurrence in the business. The year is 1987 and Linda McMahon is going to the Pennsylvania Athletic Commission to evade regulation, to get pro wrestling off of their books, essentially. The states argue that they have oversight over professional wrestling so that they could help ensure the health and safety and welfare of the wrestlers who are engaged in pro wrestling. And yet, two, they also are overseeing the health, safety, and welfare of the audience, or what they call the people who attend. They were concerned about blood. They even knew about blading. They knew that wrestlers use razors to cut their heads. And uh, the commission had a ban on blading at the time. They were concerned about alcoholic beverages and what they, cons and they considered rowdyism, basically riots in the arenas. They were concerned about people assaulting wrestlers and even told Linda McMahon about a story of somebody throwing a brick or a rock of some kind at a wrestler at a wrestling event. And um, they said they admitted and they recognized that pro wrestling wasn't a legit sport in 1987 and called it an exhibition that is for pure entertainment. The state in was being quite magnanimous. They told Linda, you know what? The cost of examinations might be a little bit much for promoters. So the state will pay for it. Ah, yes, the state will provide all examinations on your behalf. And then, they, um, but Linda, she was there. She was the executive vice president of Titan Sports at the time. Another little interesting note, Rick Santorum, who was the former Republican senator from Pennsylvania. You know, this was before he was a senator. He was one of the lawyers for the WWF at the time. So Linda, you know, made her argument. She stated that the WWF paid $44,000 to the state athletic commissions in licenses and permits for that given year. And that they had paid over $275,000 in other municipal permits, licenses, and fees. She said that a total of 13% of WWF's entire gross goes to the state of Pennsylvania. 13% of what WWE was making in 1987 went to the state of Pennsylvania. She's, of course, said that pro wrestlers are not competing in contests. What they do is entertainment. She says that these regulations require a lot of the state athletic commissions and it's a waste of their time and resources and that she sees no need for their services. She says that wrestling is not a real danger to society and that you know, these state athletic commissions are useless and counterproductive and that audit audits of these organizations often found that they are generally ineffective in their stated goals. She reminded them that 21 states do not regulate pro wrestling at all. And several had deregulated wrestling within the last five years. That means within 1982 to 1987, several states had already deregulated wrestling. She said that safety and health of the fans and of talent is the, of, is paramount to the WWF and that talent is their biggest investment and that injuries often cost them money and that ca crowd control is usually uh, operated within conjunction between the WWF and its arenas and she says that public areas and school gyms do not really want rowdy crowds she reminded them that they have considerable insurance for every event and that the WWF should be considered the same as the ice capades or the Harlem Globetrotters and should not be regulated. Both the state and Linda McMahon accepted the concept that WWF was family friendly entertainment, not a legitimate sport. And the lawyers also stepped in to say that the WWF does not condone blading, even though this was 1987, there was probably still a little bit blading going on. There likely was not a lot. 
Linda continued that some arenas required uh, insurance, whether the munic municipality required it or not. So some buildings required you to have insurance to run those buildings. And that the WWF has $1 million in insurance for every event. They did get tangled up in the muck and mire of WrestleMania 3, which the State Athletic Commission of Pennsylvania was in absolutely enamored with. They wanted to know how we could get a WrestleMania in Pennsylvania. Um, that was a question that they asked her later. <laughs> but she said, because she brought it up, you know, which is, to be fair, she the one brought it up. And she said that they had to have $5 million in insurance to run the Pontiac Silverdome for WrestleMania 3. She said, when she was, of course, asked about that, she said that regulators in Michigan were far less stringent than those in Pennsylvania, that they had successfully gotten wrestling deregulated in Connecticut, and that states who do not have state athletic commissions are where they have the most opportunity to make money. She actually set up a, a genuine scenario where she says, every time they run Pennsylvania, they have to run Ohio right afterwards and in order to make that money back, which is insane that nobody has ever mentioned that before. That Michigan, that Ohio and Pennsylvania, of course, are right next to each other. And she talked about, you know, every time they had to run Pennsylvania, they would have to run a show in Ohio, you know, almost, you know, at some point near in order to make that money back. And I was just like, wow, that was incredible. The lawyers took over in which they argued that the state should not have to provide WWF with referees and that they perfectly capable of having their own. Um, at present, all the timekeepers and referees were supplied by the State Athletic Commission. So, of course, the state knew it was a work because they were providing the referees and the timekeepers. And the State Athletic Commission wanted to know what would prevent a WrestleMania in Pennsylvania. And the lawyers responded that they pay a 5% tax already, but that tax will be doubled for any fees related to broadcasting events and that they merely can go to other states to avoid this. This was when the State Athletic Commission was comparing it to Michigan because they wanted their own WrestleMania 3. And, and Linda also said that they had no facility that was as large as the Pontiac Silverdome. That was the first thing. But then the lawyers chimed in with the economic interest that, you know, a 10% tax is just absolutely ridiculous. And why, why would we pay that? And we don't have to, um, when now the state athletic commission, they were trying to be fair, I'll give them some credit. They were trying to be fair. They asked Linda, what amount of regulations do you think is necessary? I mean, what do you think is a fair amount of regulations? And Linda McMahon responded, I don't see a need for any. She went in there arguing we want no regulations. Complete laissez-faire uh, running of pro wrestling in the state of Pennsylvania. I absolutely cannot believe that the good people of Connecticut did not want this woman as a senator. How could you not want somebody as a senator who was trying to deregulate not only her in, well her industry, of course, but she's arguing on behalf of economic freedom. I mean, she's arguing, she's telling the state athletic commissions, a lot of the stuff that you guys are trying to do, not only are you not good at it, but we already do it. You know, we already don't condone blading and we don't do it, which may or may not be true. I'm not going to sit here and try to think too much about it. I'm pretty sure somebody bladed at some point in the 80s. We already worked in conjunction with the facilities to have insurance. And we already worked in conjunction with the facilities to provide crowd control. We already do uh, physicals. Now, she said that they did drug testing, but and she said it was stringent drug testing. But of course, we know that that wasn't entirely true. So we know that there's certain elements of this stuff that's not 100% above board. Now, just because they weren't doing the most stringent drug testing possible doesn't mean they weren't doing it. They might have just been doing it and just saying, hey, we did it. How, you know, sometimes people mop the floor and the floor is still somehow dirty. You know, like you did it, you got the floor wet. It ain't quite, it's not clean, you know? 
I mean, maybe they sent, you know, a wrestler to a doctor here and there. But they didn't really have, you know, the most stringent uh, <laughs> physicians they could find. She was also asked about things like, do they provide pensions? Do they provide health insurance to the wrestlers? Of course, she told them that they're independent contractors. They're responsible for themselves. But they do help wrestlers if they are injured in the ring. And she says sometimes wrestlers are injured in car accidents and, and different outside the ring things. And they can't do anything about that. She also said she, she hooks wrestlers up with financial advisors, which means they was doing this before the NBA was doing it. You know, the NBA really just started within the last 20 years of you know, the NFL, too, of giving athletes financial advisors because wrestlers are independent contractors. They're responsible for their own retirement. And the WWF says, hey, if they listen to us and they are financially, um, what's the right word? Financially responsible. They can take care of their own retirement and we will provide for them financial advisors if necessary, to help them in that goal. But she didn't want any regulations. And it was a it was a victory for Linda McMahon. As we go to Mother Jones, who says, uh, wrote an article in 2012, hate pro wrestling, blame Rick Santorum. Despite the fact that this is kind of a Linda McMahon victory, um, this is, they chose to pick on Rick Santorum because he's a Republican from Pennsylvania. So we're going to read the bits and pieces of this article to show you how this works. It says, as a kid growing up in Western Pennsylvania, Rick Santorum spent his Saturday mornings glued to the professional wrestling set. Uh, a comic book fan saw the contest as bouts of good and evil with guys like Bruno, the living legend, San Martino, known for his such moves as the pendulum backbreaker and the airplane spin and George, the animal steel playing the perfect heroes and villains. Santorum played up his love of wrestling and in a 2006 campaign ad, which compared Washington to a chaotic wrestling ring and depicted him clotheslining a bare chested heel. <laughs> that kind of ruled. Santorum wrote in his book, It Takes a Family, professional wrestling matches as bizarre as they are at least began as morality plays. Good guys literally wearing white, fought bad guys literally wearing black. And is any good morality play, Santorum argued, there has been a fall. Today's professional wrestling is more about titillation than ever. The violence has been sexualized. This was, remember, this was in 2012. This was after the Attitude Era and all this kind of stuff. He says, but what Santorum doesn't bother to acknowledge, however, is that he helped make it happen. Though his book briefly notes his stint as the Pennsylvania Council for the World Wrestling Federation in the 1990s, it doesn't mention that he played a critical role in the nationwide deregulation push that turned the spectacle of beefy men and skimpy outfits into a billion-dollar industry and opened the door for more violence and steroid use. Now, you could tell the, the uh, political slant of Mother Jones by saying this opened the door for more violence and steroid abuse. Instead of saying it opened more door for more opportunities and for more companies to come in and be able to do business, right? There's, I mean, if we, if we create a wall, you have the option of saying that the wall keeps people out or the wall is keeping you in. That's your choice. And that's what politics is essentially is that you, something happens and then two sides argue about what the thing is, right? Is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? Make your argument about whether the glass is half empty. Make your argument about whether the glass is half full. So uh, here's uh, Jimmy Benz, the former head of the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission, who resigned his post in 1987 during the deregulation push. He says once they deregulated it, then it was kind of like allowing the animals to be in charge of the zoo. That's ridiculous. Pretty ridiculous. They give some of the backstory of uh, Santorum, but we don't care about that. Uh, then it says, this is Irv Mushnick. Wrestling used to be more like the mafia. There were territories. There was a national promotion war because of cable, and Vince McMahon won that war. But part of the whole thing was his openly acknowledging that wrestling was fake, which anyone of any intelligence already knew. But he broke the old carnival code and acknowledged it, and sort of got a campy rub out of all of that. A campy rub. Somebody should ask this guy what he means. Um, that says, by freely admitting that wrestling wasn't a legitimate athletic contest, McMahon was able to make the case that it shouldn't be held to the same regulatory standards as sports. Before the 1980s, most wrestling 
was under the jurisdiction of state athletic commissions, which were responsible for levying taxes, providing referees, and ensuring basic medical precautions. Beginning in 1987, Santorum's mission, as dedicate, dictated by the WWF, was simple. Get the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission out of the wrestling ring. There was no need for state officials to act as referees because wrestling was not a spectacle, was a spectacle, not a sport, rather. Nor did it need to supply timekeepers, announcers, and doctors. The WWF could take care of that. The new legislation, backed by Santorum and the WWF, would also reduce state taxes on wrestling events from 5% to 2%. Yes, Lord. That year, Linda McMahon, Vince's wife, and Santorum's client advised the Pennsylvania legislature to let the commission's oversight authority expire. Uh, Linda McMahon said, quote, I don't think I have to tell you how much prestige and money it would cost Titan Sports if Hulk Hogan or Andre the Giant or any number of our wrestlers were seriously injured and unable to perform. Yes, this is which the comment that she made when she talked about, you know, and they was asking about health and safety of wrestlers. She's like, you know, Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan are two of our most important guys. Why would we hold events in which they would get injured? It's a simple, basic question of um, <laughs> economic incentive. The WWF has an economic incentive in keeping the wrestlers as healthy as possible and not, you know, riding them like racehorses like they would have in the eight in the, um, in the territory era where guys would just jump from place to place, you know. Here, you, it actually makes sense that if a guy is injured and you want to keep him for the, for the long term, you would try to do something to ensure that he didn't get injured. So back to the article, it says to win lawmakers over Santorum pulled out all the stops. A 1987 Philadelphia Inquirer story noted that in the run up to the vote of the legislation, the WWF with Santorum's assistance helped write the company, quote, treated more than 20 people to complimentary tickets, hot hors d'oeuvres beer and soda at a wrestling match staffers from one of the governor's office included some who had oversight of the state athletic commission had their autographs taken with Hulk Hogan. Ah, yes. Pretty brutal, pretty brutal stuff that there, baby. At the time, Stantorum dismissed suggestions that his regulation bill would open up the industry to abuse. If anything, he told the inquirer it would give his client an added incentive to keep wrestlers healthy. These people are their income. He said, parroting Linda McMahon's earlier statement, if Hulk Hogan gets hurt, that's a pretty big loss to the WWF. Santorum did not deny that the move was a power grab by the WWF. He told Pittsburgh Press that by upping their per performance fee to $10,000, his bill would, quote, keep out small-time promoters who didn't run very good shows. So, as part of the usual, when it comes to big companies attempting to deregulate, they have to show that they actually do care, that they're empathetic. And because they have to show empathy, they have to also show that they, they, they cut both ways. That, hey, deregulate me, but I will suggest how you can regulate everyone else. That's politics again. So yes, the WWF does this quite a bit. Um, Triple H most recently within the last five or 10 years was talking about poorly run indies and how NXT was going to fix that problem. You know, all of these poorly run small time promotions, ah, the WWF can do it better. So we're going to run an NXT and have all of this, you know, try to scoop up as many indie wrestlers as we could because we can run a safer, more productive, you know, it's that kind of thing. And they were, they've been doing this for a long time because they kind of have to. You know, because nobody cares about freedom enough to just do freedom for freedom's sake. You have to just say, well, this is bad for business, but we also recognize what you want. We recognize how you want to help. And here's how you can how you can help. And that is usually by fucking over somebody who is trying to run a wrestling company too. back to the article. So Torum, who called the state's regulatory structure pernicious in a later interview, has some legitimate grievances. Quote, they go there, they sit ringside, they bring their friends over the barricade, and they watch the match. He said of state athletic officials, that's how wrestling is regulated in Pennsylvania. <laughs> they made you pay all this money to the boxing commission they used to just rape these guys. Goodness gracious. That's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty violent. Pretty violent language there. Now, here is one good, uh, thing that uh, that uh, the state legislative commission probably could have stopped 
Uh, this is from the article. It says, there was also a sign that WWF wasn't as committed to protecting its athletes as Centaurum led on. The de- deregulation legislation gave the WWF the authority to appoint its own physicians to ensure wrestlers had stable blood pressure, among other things, prior to the entering the ring. But the company was mostly focused on filling seats, not on maintaining its employer's health. This is, again, another one of those... Uh, you can see the politics of the article written. As Mushnick explains, after the law was passed, Linda McMahon retained George Sahorian, a physician with a reputation for selling alibotic steroids, and who, according to court testimony, defended his value to the organization thusly. The boys need their candies. In other words, the deregulation of pro wrestling actually led to Vince McMahon's steroid trial. Crazy how that worked, right? That because the McMahons deregulated wrestling in Pennsylvania in the 80s, that opened the door for them to get busted with the steroid trial in the early 90s. So, again, these things cut both ways. You know, uh, George Sahorian, uh, they talked extensively about that guy, especially on this channel. Um, now, I'm pretty sure if it if they had a choice... They probably still would have deregulated it and just took their because, you know, Vince really didn't still sell any steroids. He was using them personally. And so many other wrestlers were using them also. And guys were using steroids in wrestling companies, not in Pennsylvania. And guys were using steroids in wrestling before they got into wrestling. Sometimes some were just bodybuilders who were getting into wrestling. So, of course, they use steroids. The argument that's, you know, uh, deregulation led to. A rampant abuse of steroids is kind of ridiculous. It, it shows that you don't really know anything about wrestling, period. If you, because there is plenty of guys who are, who are using steroids in every state simply because they wanted to have the physique or they were bodybuilders already or they did bodybuilding or, you know, operated in gyms or whatever. And that's just kind of how it is. So it says, uh, going back to the article. It was only when the McMahons caught wind of the federal investigation that Linda cut the doctor loose. Zahorian was convicted in 1991 of 12 counts of illegally distributing drugs. In 1994, with the blessing of immunity from prosecutors, Hulk Hogan testified under oath that he had received steroids from Zahorian. Two years later, the WWF ended its policy of mandatory drug testing. So uh, they go into a little bit more of the politics of it, of uh, the deregulation campaign how linda fits in a little bit but mostly that's it uh rick santorum is given a lot of credit for the deregulation of pro wrestling in the state of pennsylvania when in reality it should have been linda mcmahon who did the she did catch some uh some left hooks and her political chance for for you know for doing this for the record um, even though it ended up did being uh, deregulated in Connecticut as well, where she ran for office still, um, when you're in the process of doing stuff for the sake of freedom, most people don't consider it that way. Anyway, they see it, look at it as a, in terms of, do you have a personal stake in the deregulation process? And usually you do, because you're the only one who cares, you know, <laughs> you know, so it's like, is it selfish to want deregulation? Absolutely. Because you're the only one who cares. It's just the same thing for all these climate scientists and everybody who want to regulate something. You're the only one who cares. So you're going to take something that is, you know, personal to you, to the government and say, hey, we should not be doing this or we should be doing this. I mean, it should come as no surprise to anyone that people lobby. And I don't like lobbying, to be quite honest. But I do believe you should be able to uh, make a statement. Now, as I said, the deregulation of wrestling in Pennsylvania led to the steroid trial in the early 90s, but, 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 it also led to the creation of ECW. As under the regulation of the State Athletic Commission, ECW would not have been able to do even half the crap they were doing. If you listen to, or even read a little bit, of what the state required of, wrestling companies to do in Pennsylvania, ECW never would have got off the ground. I'm talking, you're talking blood, you're talking fire, you're talking thumbtacks, you're talking blading, you're talking uh, vulgar language, you're talking about crooked referees, you're talking about steroids and other kinds of drugs. Oh man, ECW never would have happened. It never would have happened. So, 
the deregulation of wrestling in Pennsylvania may have also led to the Attitude Era, and which of course WWF ate a little bit, and and that led to the greatest uh, creative time in professional wrestling since the eighties. So it's a double edged sword, isn't it? But this fight is one that just will never end because people don't respect freedom. So we have to, and this is the bad side to federalism. Federalism, for those of you who don't understand, uh, is the structure of the United States government. Federalism is there's 50 states. Each state is a sovereign entity with its own laws and its own way of doing things. And then on top of that is the national government, or we call the federal government. Um, laws that has gone through the federal government applies to all of the states. Now, what some people would try to do is they would try to pass laws at the federal level that violate the rights of the individual states. This was uh, something that the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution kind of deals with. Now, because we have a federal system and wrestling was regulated by states, that means the McMahons had to go from state to state to argue for the deregulation of wrestling. Which means they had to go to Pennsylvania and they had to go somewhere else to do it and they had to go somewhere else to do it. Costs a lot of money. For for those of you who may not be into wrestling, this is something Dana White had to do as well when it comes to mixed martial arts. Because for a long time, mixed martial arts was banned in a lot of these states. So Dana White would have to go from state to state to state to state to state to state to, state to get them to at least acknowledge mixed martial arts and come up with a fair set of rules. And this becomes this. This is why UFC and WWE end up being the largest and most prosperous in their sport because they took on what other people did not take on. Other people would rather do things because they didn't have the money. They would do things behind closed doors and risk getting caught while you know, uh, Vince and Dana White are trying to do things above board, at least to a degree, and say, at least get your, create some fair rules, at least, or get your boot off, boot off, your boot off our neck completely, which is, you know, what they wanted, really. But at least they wanted some fair rules. So when we see the McMahons, and people poo poo this, but they're saying, hey, it's not fair to regulate wrestling the way you regulate boxing, because professional wrestling is not like boxing in so much that it's not real and you know it works it works sometimes as we see from the missouri state nonsense it didn't work completely from the maryland nonsense that we'll be talking about a little in a little bit it didn't work completely so those states still regulate professional wrestling as if it was a regular sport which makes no earthly sense but it is you know so Dana White, that's why also why Dana White uh, loves Vince McMahon so much. If people didn't know that, he probably would never come out and say it. He would just talk about how great a promoter he is. But it's because Vince was the one who sort of set the standard. You have to go into these states individually and make your argument. And in doing so, you do create your own competition. Like I said, in Pennsylvania, they went in there and deregulated wrestling. That allowed for more wrestling promotions to pop up in Pennsylvania because they didn't need licenses and stuff like that anymore. Same thing in our next state, which is the state of New Jersey. Before we get into the history a little bit, we got to talk about Maryland State Athletic Commission. Now, Maryland, uh, they got a little bit of attention in 2019, 2020, after they fined both AEW and Ring of Honor for blood in their promotions. So the consent orders actually came out May 20th, 2020 for the two fines for ring of honor and AEW. Actually, I think it's total five fines. I think so AEW, their fine uh, came from their November 9th, 2019 show where they did the barbed wire match between Kenny Omega and John Moxley. It says, that blood was introduced into the match in violation of state athletic commission regulations. Jonathan Good and Tyson Smith repeatedly used foreign objects wrapped in barbed wire to strike and lacerate one another. AEW was fully advised by the state athletic commission to prohibit blood. AEW promoters said there will be no plans for blood. 
AEW agreed to the consent order to avoid litigation. State Athletic Commission acknowledges AEW took precautions to reduce potential injury and in some instance simulate bleeding. Blood was introduced um, into the match via the repeated actions of the performers. The State Athletic Commission prohibits physically dangerous conduct and deliberate lacerations of oneself or opponent by introducing human or animal blood into the ring. AEW was fined $10,000. $10,000. Now, you could argue that uh, AEW agreed that they would not participate in any blood. Then they had a barbed wire match, which of course begs the idea of blood, but they can't even simulate blood. You can't even have blood simulations, which is very bizarre. Now, let's talk about this Ring of Honor uh, fine. So Ring of Honor had a show December 13th, 2019. Same thing. Blood was introduced into the match in violation of commission regulations. Mark Haskins and Mark LaMonico, who is Bully Ray. Uh, LaMonico threw Haskins into a table laced with barbed wire, causing lacerations. Ring of Honor told Commission prior to that there would be no blood and there was no plans for blood. State Athletic Commissioner interviewed all participating wrestlers, including Mr. Haskins and Mr. LaMonico, to ensure blood was not planned and would not be introduced into the match. Both told State Athletic Commission there was no plans for blood. Mr. Haskins and Mr. LaMonico agreed to consent order to settle this case to avoid litigation. They were going to sue them. Ring of Honor stated that the ends of the barbed wire was clipped to reduce potential injury, but admitted blood was caused by the plywood barbed wire apparatus. The State Athletic Commission prohibits deliberate lacerations of oneself or one's opponent. ROH is found in violation of the give the state code. It says Ring of Honor, Mr. Haskins and Mr. LaMonico agreed to pay the State Athletic Commission a civil penalty of $2,000 each. That's $6,000 total. So, well, actually, technically it's four. Four fines. You know, one, for Ring of, um, one for Ring of Honor, one for Mark Haskins, and one for Bully Ray, and then also one for AEW. Now, Kenny Omega and, uh, and uh, mm, sorry, and uh, John Moxley, they were not found individually to be um, in violation of this, which is very strange. And I really want to ask the question, why would that be? Why is it that when Ring of Honor <clears throat> was fined, the, the wrestlers were fined individually? But in AEW, it was AEW agreed to pay $10,000. Interesting. Now, it probably would have been, I think it sounded like AEW paid more. But there was also more egregious. They had a match that was set up specifically for blood. But that's neither here nor there. The point is that Mark Haskins is not a big name pro wrestler. He really isn't. $2,000 out of that guy's pockets? That's crazy. Now, Bully Ray, of course, he's been doing this for years. But Mark Haskins is a guy who, come on, you, you probably don't even know who I'm talking about, do you? Now, the state has, you know, blood is something that, okay, it's blading is a thing that I think we can, most of us will agree, probably not the best idea, probably not the best idea to do, but the, the state defining deliberate lacerations as you falling on barbed wire that you specifically clipped so that it wouldn't be sharp and... You, that causing lacerations with introduced blood. It's absolutely ridiculous. It is quite frankly ridiculous. Now, that state athletic commission also has tons of rules. And they have a laundry list of licensing requirements and all such nonsense. Let's go through some of the Maryland State Athletic Commission licensing rules real quick. So to be a pro wrestler in the state of Maryland, you have to be 18 years of age. And it, the applicant who does not have amateur or professional experience will have to demonstrate to the state athletic commission that the applicant is properly trained and is capable of performing the artistic uh, skill. Or they show that the artistic skill of being a wrestler. So basically you have to prove to the state that you can wrestle. 
And why, how would you manage to do that? Unknown. Unknown. You also need to complete a physical exam. Wrestlers, uh, seconds, managers, referees, timekeepers, etc. cannot engage in any physical contact unless they have a wrestler's license. So you want to do a ref bump? Nope. Can't do that. Can't do a ref bump because your referee is not a licensed wrestler. Can't. What? You can't do a ref bump because. (sighs) So. It said the state athletic commission may deny a license to any applicant or revoke licenses if one, you are convicted of a felony or a crime involving involving moral turpitude. Jesus. Two, you violated the state athletic commission regulations. Three, you violated the state athletic commission directives. Four, you failed to demonstrate physical competence to the satisfaction of the state athletic commission. This would be for wrestlers or MMA fighters and boxers. There's an actual age requirement for boxers. I think it's like 36 or something like that. Same thing with uh, MMA fighters. It's uh, five, you failed to comply with health and safety standards. Six, you fraudulently or deceptively obtained a license. Seventh, you fraudulently or deceptively used a license. Eighth, you failed to properly supervise the activities of an official or employee of the license. It said the state athletic commission may impose a $2,000 fine per violation. If license is denied, cannot apply for one year. If license is revoked, the state athletic commission may impose time limits before you can reapply. There is, uh, and of course, Ring of Honor was based in Maryland. So they did, they dealt with this stuff a lot. They had a really strong relationship with the state athletic commission, you know, and going through the Maryland website, I found all types of, uh, Joe Coff, uh, state athletic commission, them putting together the, the pandemic shows for ring of honor, where they had the, the crowd list matches, all that stuff was there. And it was, it was interesting to see, and it was very interesting to watch how that manifested and how it unfolded. For instance, in June uh, 2020, Joe Coff went to the State Athletic Commission and argued that they had a need for more content for their television show. So he had to ask for permission to have multiple day tapings of the Ring of Honor TV show. Uh, Sinclair Broadcasting, of course, was based in Maryland. He had come prepared with all of the social distancing guidelines and isolation spaces and and all of this stuff. In uh, what was this September, Joe Coff went again to the State Athletic Commission, arguing that it is uh, imperative to keep their product current. They needed to continue taping. And of course, the state would eventually allow them to do uh, a couple of sets of tapings. I think there ended up being five total sets of tapings that they were able to do. And they created like this entire menagerie of rules. Now, at this point in time, we're in the middle of a global pandemic, kind of, you know, and okay. But they had rules such as every table had to be six inches and there had to be a, a, a strip of blue tape down the middle and the wrestlers bags couldn't touch each other and the wrestlers couldn't cross this blue tape. They had to ask for permission to shoot promos in the ROH dojo. Of course they had to have three COVID tests before they can even do promos. I'm talking, I ain't talking about wrestling. I'm talking about just going into the dojo to do promos. And this was absolutely insane. Now, Joe Coff, of course, uh, being a nice guy that he is, He sent a a kind of a letter to the State Athletic Commission saying that they were, uh, quote, setting a responsible standard for the wrestling industry. This, of course, during the time when WWE was getting busted, everybody was testing positive. Now, some people tested positive in Ring of Honor, but it wasn't a lot. It wasn't nearly as many as uh, the people who tested positive in WWE, mainly because of the NXT roster was basically just doing their thing. So the State Athletic Commission uh, in Maryland is I couldn't fit, I couldn't find how much the license is. I probably could have taken it to the next step and found out how much uh, it costs to, to get a license. Um, both, of course, WWE and AEW are both licensed in Maryland, and they're both up to date on their licenses. Um, but it's just insane that accidental blood 
in one instance, it was well. In, in the instance of Bully Ray and Mark Haskins, it was accidental, and they got fined two thousand dollars a piece, and the company got fined. And you know, AEW, it was pretty obvious. Now I know that um, there was not that long ago where people believed that somebody stooged off, you know, <laughs> AEW, and that's the reason they were under investigation. I was like, no, these people have televisions. All right. The state athletic commission wanders around backstage. The state athletic commission is probably sitting in the front row of these shows. They didn't trust me. Nobody needed to stooge, bro. You probably found somebody who likely did file some kind of complaint, but trust me, it wasn't necessary. The state athletic commission is on top of these guys on top. And it's, it's smothering. It is so paternal. That we have this situation where these guys are telling you what you can and can't do in a sport that they recognize is not real. It just doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, I don't know. I know some people are going to agree with this kind of stuff and they're going to say, Mongo, you don't sound serious. Why would you want to get rid of the State Athletic Commission? If there wasn't, you'd be more Ric Flair last matches. It'd be 75 year old guys trying to fight 22 year olds in boxing matches. And I will say to my, I'll say to you, maybe, maybe not. You know, we don't know, but I can tell you that there's more of a history of the State Athletic Commission using licenses to be corrupt than they are to actually help anybody. I scoured the various books that I've read on wrestling to find information about State Athletic Commissions and licensing and what dubious ways licenses and State Athletic Commissions have been used throughout history. So, from Hornbaker's book on the NWA, the National Wrestling Alliance, The Untold Story, he tells that the NWA would often use threats of pulling a wrestler's license in order to control wrestlers. They would threaten them with suspension. And since they all had political authority to some degree, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that they would use that political authority to keep wrestlers in line, threaten to pull a guy's license. The NWA members will often lobby to have licenses limited to keep out competition, which would mean to prevent what they call outlaw organizations. In Horbreaker's book on Death of the Territories, he stated that some states only issued a single license to promote professional wrestling. This, of course, is creating a monopoly in the state. And such states, such as Washington and Louisiana, had these sorts of issues going on. Bill Watts, of course, had these only wrestling license in the state of Louisiana. We'll talk about that in a moment. Ole Anderson in his book, Inside Out, How Corporate America Destroyed Wrestling, stated on the subject of Georgia Championship Wrestling, the State Athletic Commission only interested in measuring the height of the ring, making sure you had proper wrestling attire, and that they had their cockamamie doctors at ringside. In Michigan, the commissioners got, got in for free and was allowed to wander around in the locker room. They got to be big shots. He said the commissioners found any reason to bug you so that you'd pay them off. Such as he tells a story about the ring being too low. That the ring, they were told that the ring was too low. They had to cancel the event because the ring was too low. So he offered to pay the guy off and all of a sudden, ah, it's a regular regulation ring now. That the commission does nothing for wrestlers and provides no health benefits, no pensions. And that the licenses were just means of extortion. In Hornbaker's book on the Capital Revolution, which is a story that they did on the McMahons, the New York State Athletic Commission cut down on non-wrestlers and banished, quote, dramatic performers, which, quote, abolished the colorfulness of wrestlers and destroyed the territory. In 1937, licenses were so, the State Athletic Commission was so powerful that licensing threats gave the commissions way too much authority on what they could and could not do. In the state of Maryland, William Olivas, who wrestled as the Elephant Boy, was denied a license, a promoter's license, in the state of Maryland because he had not lived there for one year. Ridiculous. You think he's running for office or something. In Pat LeBride and Dan Murphy's Sisterhood of the Square Circle, they talk about how women's wrestlers had difficulties obtaining licenses, and New York State, for instance, had banned women's wrestling until 1972, which was, of course, a violation of the Civil Rights Act. In Greg Klein's book, King of New Orleans, uh, which is a history on Mid-South Wrestling and the Junkyard Dog, Bill Watts was the only performer in Louisiana 
and had to employ state athletic commission stooges um, as who were quote political appointees as quote promoters, even though they did no real promoting. And that this scheme cost Bill Watts over three hundred thousand dollars in state ath- com- at state athletic commission payoffs. And that it didn't end until Watts allowed the WWF to run in Louisiana. And of course he did so not only to break up the patronage system, but because he believed he could fight Vince off. He did so to some extent depends on, you know, the degree he may have won many of the head to head victories and his style was, you know, a little bit more popular in Louisiana, but you can look at it and tell $300,000 a year in those ridiculous licensing fees and, the state athletic commission essentially was extorting him. So just wild stuff, right? Why have them? Why do we need these organizations? Why do they exist? I mean, it's a question that has plagued me for a while. I talk all the time on this channel when I'm going on my libertarian stuff. We don't need mandatory minimums. We don't need mandatory maximums, you know, minimum wage. We don't need that crap. We don't need unions. We don't need licenses, You know, what do we need licenses for? The government tells you all the time, we're doing this for your health and safety and there's fire regulations and, you know, all this kind of other crap. And, you know, a couple of bucks here and there make all that stuff go away. And I could expand upon this subject if I wanted to and start including all sorts of occupational licenses. But I'm not going to because I wanted to focus purely on wrestling. And show people how something as simple as making people sign up for licenses and regulations by the state athletic commissions can affect business. Have businesses shut down. Have wrestlers lose their jobs. This stuff is serious, serious stuff. That being said, how serious is it? So economist Walter E. Williams was one of the first people that brought it to my attention that licenses are often operating hand in hand with cronyism. He also talked about what was called the medallion system in terms of uh, taxis and that the medallions increased the cost of entry into this industry. So they were creating licenses for taxis. And this would, of course, prevent people from just getting in a taxi and driving their own taxi service. He says, quote, insiders want licensing laws to keep outsiders out and to charge higher prices. Then he said that big companies prefer licensing laws because everyone wants a monopoly on what they sell, but competition on what they buy. Double back to what I said about the NWA. Everybody, these are big companies. Now, they aren't WWE big, but for Christ's sake, Bill Watts, again, the only promoter to have a license in Louisiana. That means if you wanted to run a wrestling promotion in Louisiana, you had to run unlicensed. And if somebody found out that you didn't have a license, well, you were subject to all type of fines and jail time because you didn't have a license. We don't have a licensed chap. So this kind of stuff happened literally all the time. There were tons of people running unlicensed wrestling shows because it was the only way they could run. The NWA guys may own the license or may have uh, new people who control the licensing structure. They could keep you out if they wanted to. A monopoly on what they sell. They sold wrestling. They want a monopoly on that. But competition on what they want to buy. Now, there was another uh, group of economists, Peter Q. Blair, Bobby W. Chung, they wrote a paper, it's called How Much of a Barrier to Entry is Occupational Licensing? They ran a study that found that licenses reduces labor supply by an average of 17 to 27%. So it has a negative effect on labor supply. And that licensing in the United States increased from 5% to 25% in the last 60 years. That means 60 years ago. There was about 5% of all jobs required you for you to have a license. Now, over 25% of them do. This includes barbers, uh, people who want nail techs, um, people who want to drive taxi drivers. I just talked about taxi drivers. 
It includes uh, behavioral analysts, uh, social workers, teachers, and just on and on and on ad nauseum. A lot of these people who have licenses and it's the purpose of this is to keep the cost high for the people who have licenses. It's the exact same issue we got with unions. Unions increase the cost of labor. Now, you may say that that's a good thing. You know, the guy who works in a factory, he makes more money. It's like, well, yes, sure. But what about all the other people who can't find jobs? What about all the people you know who can do hair, but they don't have a license? And if they get busted doing hair without a license. What, what do you think is going to happen to them? Again, fines, maybe even jail time if they can't pay the fines. So now I, I started with talking about the state of Missouri. And of course, I'm going to sign the petition to get, you know, wrestling taken out of the State Athletic Commission of Missouri. I don't think it should be there in the first place. But I just thought it was an interesting subject to talk about, to riff on, to tell people, hey, it ain't over. There's still State Athletic Commissions that regulate pro wrestling. There is other ones out there. I didn't take the time to, you know, look into... You know, but I'm pretty sure some of them have, are weaker than they used to be. And that sort of, you know, a, a modern argument is that these commissions are not nearly as strong as they once were. But they still exist and they still are fleecing uh, wrestling companies. They're still uh, limiting the growth of wrestling promotions with their silly licensing laws and their silly, absolutely ridiculous uh, taxation. It's... This is the sort of, I don't want to call it the perfect subject for me to discuss as a libertarian wrestling fan, but it's a pretty strong subject. And again, I'm willing to take the L on certain things. Yes, deregulating wrestling led to a lot of stuff that probably it shouldn't have. Steroid trial, uh, some of, you know, some of the stuff that in ECW where guys were doing drugs a lot. Yes, uh, even ridiculous stuff like, but, you know, Let's, let's calm down for a moment. You still had some really positive things that come out of there. A lot of the reason why you were able to have uh, certain wrestling promotions like ECW, like Ring of Honor, that came out of you know the, the Northeast, where the McMahons did most of their deregulation efforts, you know, was because that the McMahons went in there and deregulated wrestling. So, yes, there were some negatives, but there was a lot more positives that came out of it. More people were able to create more wrestling companies. And we got to see bigger stars come out of these companies. You know, at least stars for the future. So maybe they didn't know that in the 80s when they were doing it. But they certainly knew that they were stunting the growth of at least the WWF in the 80s when they were de you know, they're trying to deregulate wrestling. They knew these states are stunting the growth of our company. They're stunting the growth of our industry. And in deregulating them, they allowed growth in this area. So that means getting rid of all their fucking licensing, all their stupid rules. Like, they have to give people referees. Like, what the fuck I need a referee from you for? What is going on here? And some states were smart and actually participated, did the right thing, and deregulated wrestling, as it should be. It is not a sport. It is entertainment. And it's, it, even if, look... And I know that there's going to be people who want to disagree with me on this. Perfectly fine. State your argument. State why wrestling should be, you know, regulated as a sport under a state athletic commission. Now, some of them have done smart things. For instance, they no longer have a state athletic commission, but maybe they have some other regulatory body over uh, pro wrestling. And some of you may say, well, I don't like ECW. I don't like GCW, Game Changer Wrestling. I don't like that stuff. So maybe we should have something that will prevent them, these outlaw mud shows, from popping up in these states. You know, that's kind of the Jim Cornette argument. I've heard him argue on behalf of state athletic commissions before. Um, when it comes to, I think, was it uh, Axel Rotten or Ian Rotten's wrestling promotion? Um, he basically said that there should be state athletic commissions to keep them guys out. And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I'm a freedom guy. If people wants to go into the middle of a wheat field and blade themselves and, and dare, dare, dare kill one another, as long as they're adults, I don't care. You know, 
And that's generally my attitude. Same thing with steroids. People are adults. I don't see why the government was trying to regulate steroids. Why do you care if somebody wants to put, you know, steroids in their body and make to make themselves appear stronger or whatever? Who cares? If it was a legitimate sport, okay. You know, because it is an unfair advantage in basketball, football, baseball, or whatever. All right. But, you know, I wouldn't go that far when it comes to pro wrestling. I mean, really, who cares, bro? It doesn't matter how you look. You could look like, you know, uh, Paul Orndorff, and they'll still make you do a job to a guy who looks like Spike Dudley. I mean, that's how pro wrestling works, you know. But in boxing, MMA, football, I understand why you want to ban steroids because it is an unfair advantage. That being said, pro wrestling is not football. It's not basketball. It is not mixed martial arts. I don't see why Vince was on trial for steroid abuse. It just makes no sense to me. You know, it's just, it's silly. And I know I'm in the, I'm in the minority on this. And I get that. I respect it. But from the minority, I'm telling you, the government has no business creating licensing rules for most of these sports. I don't even think they should be able to have licenses for boxing and stuff like that. I want state athletic commissions gone. I don't even think MMA needs them. I'm pretty sure Dana White would disagree with me because again, it's how he protects his business. You know, you have these one size fits all rules that his company can maintain because they're multi-billion dollars while other smaller promotions might not be able to do that. You know? So again, like I said earlier, it cuts both ways. You know, you, he, cre he helped craft the rules that now other people have to play by, but the rules are crafted because UFC can follow them while other people are kind of like, wait a minute, you know, we can't really grow because these rules are fit for a multi-billion dollar organization. So yes, you know, I think we should get rid of, you know, state athletic commissions and let freedom reign. Let's see what happens if we didn't have you know, so many state athletic commissions. Sure, you, you might have ridiculous stuff like men wrestling bears again. And somebody's going to get mauled and eaten by tiger as we do man versus tiger matches or some, some crazy stuff like that. But I'm at, I'm at the point now, man, where I'm kind of like, if you're stupid enough to do that, then go for it. If you're stupid enough to let a 75 year old man wrestle in a wrestling ring and he dies, guess what? Too bad. You know? Sometimes death is the cost of freedom. It's not guaranteed all roses and bubbles. I take, I understand that in arguing for freedom, there's going to be negatives. I'm saying that the positives are going to outweigh the negatives. Now, thank you everybody for listening. This video is far longer than I intended it to be, but thank you. Um, like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later, man. Peace out.